the starting point of this uh, p paper was that we realized that there was a central question in, in urban and, and real estate economics, and even beyond that, of the impact of the supply of credit uh, on, on house prices. And, and the central question has been carefully addressed uh, using uh, instrumental variable uh, techniques or identification strategies, uh, for instance, in the paper by Ince and Favara, um, using the deregulation uh, of banking in the uh, uh, mid-1990s, uh, looking at you know, regression discontinuity designs at the border uh, of, of states. And there's the Adelino Shoa and Severino paper that looks at regression discontinuity based on the uh, distance to the jumbo loan uh, securitization threshold. And, and, and these identification strategies are extremely careful and they give credible estimates, but somehow they focus on one particular segment uh, of the market, giving us a, a local average treatment effect. And, and one of the, the things that we wanted to, to sort of try to explain or at least understand um, is, is why there are large uh, within city uh, uh, shifts in the distribution of house prices. Uh, that is, there is descriptive evidence that there are both shifts in the mean, the median, and in the standard deviation of house prices. Uh, so that, for instance, uh, Ferreira and Jurko show that uh, uh, the timing of the boom is, is very different within the city. But also Piazza, Ilan Voigt, and Schneider show that there is a compression of the house price distribution uh, in San Diego. Um, their, their model is calibrated. We observe a compression of the price distribution in our data, also in other cities, uh, other MSAs in Los Angeles, uh, San Francisco, and Washington, D.C. during the, the period of observation that is from 2006 uh, to, from 2000 to 2006. And, and we wanted to understand the impact of the supply of credit on the distribution of house prices, but, but that became a, a, a daunting exercise because we needed to understand not only what is the uh, elasticity of house prices to the supply of credit, but also how households choose across locations based on how much credit availability uh, they have uh, to uh, choose a particular uh, neighborhood. So we started with the core structure of the location choice model of, of the Bay Levinson and Pecos uh, literature that has been uh, used by Bayer in his uh, JP paper. Um, and Holmes and Ziegen in 2015 in the handbook chapter in urban economics argue for uh, more use of the structural uh, econometric uh, literature in, in the field. And that's what we're doing here. We develop a general equilibrium model of, of location choice where people make a trade-off uh, uh, between the amenity and the price. Um, they choose a neighborhood within the Bay Area. Um, but we we uh, uh, have in the model the fact that people's pref preferences are not fully expressed in their choices in the sense that their choices reflect both their borrowing constraints um, and uh, their preference uh, for the particular set of amenities uh, in a particular uh, neighborhood. And the way we model it is through a flexible uh, um, uh, representation of the choice sets that households uh, face. That is, in each neighborhood, uh, they will face a probability of being approved for a mortgage, uh, and that will determine uh, their, uh, uh, the, the set of neighborhoods that they can pick from. Because we explicitly model the uh, determination of the choice set uh, that each household faces, we can uh, see what a relaxation of lending standards implies in terms of the growth of demand and also the growth of prices so we can predict the shifts in the distribution of prices in response to a shift in the supply of credit. And we can try to see whether we can account for the compression in the of the price distribution uh, in, in the San Francisco Bay Area. Uh, using those structural models implies uh, a fairly a significant challenge in terms of identifying the different uh, uh, preferences for amenities, 
but also for the supply of credit. Um, we focus on the identification of the supply of credit because we use standard <laughs> techniques for the identification of the preference for amenities. For the supply of credit, what we'll use is that we will use the liquidity of the national bank um, and the location of the bank branches in the Bay Area to see um, uh, to use a source of variation in the supply of credit at the local level in the Bay Area that is orthogonal uh, or at least arguably orthogonal to people's uh, decision to apply in a particular uh, na neighborhood. Um, we, uh, in, the, in the third part of the paper, we do comparative statics of the impact of changes in the landing standards to see uh, what is the shift in the log price in each of our 4,500 uh, blog groups in the Bay Area. Um, and we will also look at how uh, credit supply changes the demographics of neighborhoods. And one of the uh, uh, perhaps counterintuitive results that we find is that giving more credit uh, to households leads to house price uh, increases that may offset the beneficial impact of the increase in the supply of credit for low-income minorities uh, in, in the Bay Area. So we find that um, uh, the borrowing elasticity, that is how um, um, the uh, log price affects the demand purely through the borrowing channel, uh, that elasticity is more than half of the total elasticity of demand uh, for housing uh, in a neighborhood. And 47% 40 per is the traditional elasticity that we have in the location choice models, which in this paper we call the conditional uh, elasticity. We, um, we do a fairly decent job at predicting the compression of the price distribution between 2000 and 2006 with a correlation between the initial log price and the change in the log price of minus 0.3 uh, and the actual compression of the price distribution was about minus 0.7. Um, and we will show graphs where we show that uh, the, the shape of the shift in the distribution is, is graphically, uh, strikingly uh, uh, going in the, in the right direction. Uh, we match key moments of the distribution of the price changes. Uh, the mean uh, uh, in um, annual uh, terms uh, increases by uh, 10 percent in the prediction and 11 percent in the actual data set. Standard deviation of the price changing 4.5, uh, actual 5.5, uh, uh, first quartile 7.5, actual 7.2, and upper quartile 11.6 and actual 14.8. So um, uh, if we we're doing a better job than this, I think we could say that it's, it, the, it's, it's like so good that it would be suspicious. I, I, I think when I saw the results coming from from the analysis, I was, I was uh, particularly struck by this. Uh, we also showed that there is an increase in Asian isolation, black isolation, and Hispanic isolation. These isolation measures, um, they're segregation measures. They essentially measure uh, the average fraction of, uh, say, uh, Asian uh, neighbors for an average Asian individual uh, in a block group. And indeed, the, the increase in the supply of credit in this context leads to an increase in isolation uh, because people are bidding up uh, housing, the price of housing, in neighborhoods where there are more people like them. Uh, and that leads to an increase in racial isolation in the Bay Area. Um, in the, a lot of time, I'm going to try to uh, present the model and its equilibrium property, how we identify the model. Um, and I hope to convince you that we have a credible identification strategy for credit supply as opposed to credit demand. I'm going to describe uh, borrowing and conditional elasticities. And then after that, we're going to be able to use the model, if we believe in the model, to simulate the impact of the change in credit supply on prices and segregation. I'm going to make some choices, uh, mythological choices, saying, you know, I'm, I'm going to put aside, for instance, the question of, of rental and home ownership. But that's something that we uh, ha discuss in the appendix of the paper. Uh, I know it's been a long read, uh, <laughs> Chris. Um, but, but essentially, we, <laughs> uh, we, we discuss how the elasticity of housing supply is featured in a model of population growth and demographic shifts. And so there's, there's a number of points that, that we discuss. And I hope to have time to discuss them here. So for the model, um, we start with a, a fairly standard um, location choice model essentially where households trade off uh, price and amenities. 
uh, in, the, in the BLP context, there is a, a utility for each household, for each neighborhood J each year that depends on the base utility term that is common to all households. And then there are heterogeneous preferences in the sense that some people want to be close to uh, uh, people of particular demographic. Uh, some people have higher or lower preferences for schooling. Uh, or, or crime, and so we have terms for heterogeneous preferences uh, here in the utility uh, of, of each neighborhood. The base utility will depend on, on the log price, and in a first order approximation, this alpha is going to be a measure of elasticity of, of demand with respect to, uh, to prices. There's going to be a vector ZJT of amenities uh, of each neighborhood, and XIT, a vector of household characteristics um, and then we're going to have some random coefficients to avoid the problem of the, uh, of the independence of irrelevant alternatives and capture some more flexible um, observations. Now, we get conditional on the choice set that is the set of neighborhoods that people can pick from. We get the traditional uh, uh, BLP demand, which is just a function of the utility of each neighborhood uh, and the utility uh, of the neighborhood that we choose. But this, this, the, the, the additional thing in this in this work is that uh, this demand is conditional on, on that particular choice set. So what's missing here is, and, and I'm going to present it in the next slide, is how the choice set is modeled and how the set of, of uh, neighborhoods that households can choose from uh, emerges endogenously uh, from uh, the supply of uh, mortgage credit. So the, the probability of getting approved for a mortgage um, plays a big role just uh, because in the data set we observe that uh, among the set of applications uh, the approval rate is about 70-75% uh, uh, and so we have a denial rate uh, that is substantial and that affects uh, the choice set of households. For each household we have a probability of being approved for a mortgage credit in each neighborhood in each year um, and that um, uh, the probability of, the cho of each choice set will thus be the product of the probability of being approved in each of the uh, neighborhoods in the choice set times one minus the probability of being approved. So we sort of have this sort of stochastic way of modeling uh, the uh, probability of each choice set. And then we make the decision uh, to approve a, a, a mortgage by the lender a function of the household characteristics, the neighborhood, house, and mortgage characteristics and interaction terms, the identification of these uh, lending standards is going to be a, 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 an important focus of the, of the paper. Thus, the total demand for uh, each uh, neighborhood in, in each uh, year is going to be integrated over all of the conditional demands uh, weighted by the probabilities of the choice sets. Uh, and it's going to be integrated over uh, the characteristics of uh, each household. So we can see here that the aggregate demand is going to come from uh, many different types of households. There is uh, uh, different types of uh, uh, ethnicities and races and income levels. Um, and it's going to be uh, affected by the lending policies uh, of, the, of the banks. Uh, because we've, got, we've made this modeling, we can already uh, get a decomposition of the total elasticity of demand into the conditional elasticity, the traditional elasticity, and the borrowing elasticity. Uh, we can see that the total elasticity of demand for a neighborhood uh, J is going to be the sum of that conditional elasticity that is at a given choice set without uh, having an impact of prices on the credit availability. And this is uh, the part of the elasticity that is driven by the impact of the price on the probability of approval for uh, a mortgage application. So um, the log price has these two channels. And, and an empirical question is, is, is going to be whether this term accounts for a large share of the total uh, eta uh, JT elasticity. The cross price demand elasticities are not going to be affected by the borrowing constraints as long as uh, the uh, decisions to approve a mortgage are IIDs. If there is a correlation across neighborhoods in uh, mortgage approval probabilities, that's going to affect the cross price demand elasticities. Um, and the income elasticities are, can also be decomposed uh, because income affects both the uh, trade off between amenity and price and the um, and the uh, probability of approval for mortgage application. Uh, 
um, neat stuff that gives us an equilibrium model where uh, we have uh, 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 a, a, an equilibrium we can write as a vector of prices and a vector of demographics. There's the vector of demographics in the equilibrium because they're same race preferences. So this is a city that can have a potentially very large number of equilibria uh, because in each neighborhood there is a shelling model in that sense of, of, of tipping that, that can occur here. But we can, despite the complexity of that uh, city equilibrium, uh, we show the existence of the equilibrium in price and demographics. And I can show that each equilibrium is locally unique. So we're going to be able to change the landing standards locally around the equilibrium to see how the price distribution changes around that particular uh, equilibrium. Uh, there's a finite number of equilibria. And uh, uh, it, there's even an odd number of equilibria, but it doesn't matter. Uh, uh, we can uh, show that there's global uniqueness if we don't have those same race preferences, if we don't have these preferences for uh, um, uh, the income of the neighbors or the race of the neighbors. For the identification strategy, um, I'm going to use uh, uh, three sets of moments uh, to identify my structural parameters. I'm going to start with the uh, usual uh, uh, instruments that are used in the BLP literature, they're used by Bayer uh, in his JP paper, uh, which is to, um, um, when in regressing the base utility of a neighborhood on the price, uh, uh, the problem, uh, that's why there needs to be an instrument, is that we get a positive coefficient. Uh, that, that is, in fact, the vector of observables that we have for properties is not sufficient to control for all of the unobservable dimensions uh, that uh, characterize that, that property. Um, and so prior papers have used the two-step neighboring blocks uh, as a way to instrument for the observable characteristics of each neighborhood. Uh, and uh, we, we thus obtain elasticities are reasonable uh, using these uh, two-step uh, neighboring uh, blocks. For preference heterogeneity, I'm also not going to depart from that uh, literature, and I'm going to estimate preference heterogeneity by matching the spatial distribution of races, ethnicities, and incomes, and education across uh, the Bay Area to, uh, uh, because we need the preference heterogeneity to explain the segregation of households across, across neighborhoods. Um, the the, the uh, uh, new uh, thing, perhaps, in this uh, paper is the uh, landing standards and the way we identify the, 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 the impact of household characteristics and mortgage characteristics on the probability of approval. And the way we do this is um, because we use an instrument um, uh, that was um, uh, uh, the first used in a paper by Lutzkina, uh, in a paper by Lutzkina and Tahan. Uh, that, that is looking at the liquidity of the national banks, that is arguably independent of the local conditions uh, of uh, each uh, neighborhood. And we use the location of the bank branches from the summary of deposit. Um, we link each uh, bank branch to its corresponding uh, national bank and its liquidity. And the shifts in the liquidity of the national bank uh, sort of flow to the local neighborhood and explain uh, the uh, credit conditions uh, at, the local, uh, at the local level. The data that is used in this paper is we have 4,400 4, 4, plus neighborhoods uh, in, the, in the Bay Area. That is, we use the block groups. Uh, we uh, match the, um, uh, uh, block groups to the block groups to the Hamda files. Uh, it's very important here in this paper, and I think it, it sort of differentiates this paper from other papers that also look at borrowing constraints in location choice, is that we use the Hamda data because they have approval uh, and applications. Uh, and it's very important to look at the set of applications rather than the set of approved mortgages to get at the uh, lending standards uh, in the uh, metro area. Uh, the comprehensive transaction data set from FNC, which is a, a company that uh, uh, um, guarantees mortgages, and they give us the closing price, they give us the street address, so we can match it to the block group. Uh, we use the micro census at 1% to get the uh, distribution of household characteristics in the metro area. A and um, for schools, we use the California Academic Performance Index, uh, which is published and, and policy. Uh, relevant. For the liquidity measures, 
We use the reports of income and, uh, and condition, the core reports, uh, and, and the Hamna crosswalk to, to match the respondent IDs with the uh, bank identifiers. And there's a little bit of, of work to make sure that the neighborhood borders boundaries are the same across the 30 years of the, of the analysis. So the choice sets uh, are a neat theoretical idea. The, the issue is that with uh, 4,400 neighborhoods, there are potentially two to the power of 4,400 neighborhoods, which is more than the number of atoms in the universe. Uh, so that, 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 that theoretical idea uh, suddenly hits a, uh, a roadblock. Uh, the way we solve this problem is, is by simulating demand. And it turns out that simulation is a way to get fairly uh, consistent estimates of the, um, of, the, of the demand. So for each uh, household, uh, I, in each year uh, of, the, of the observation, we predict the probability of approval uh, for each neighborhood. So we get this, uh, this sort of uh, a rectangle where we have the probability of approval for each household in each neighborhood. And hopefully, if the IV strategy is, is right, that's, that, that allows us to impute what would be the probability of approval for each household, even if that person has not applied uh, for a mortgage uh, in that uh, neighborhood. Then I draw uh, S choice sets, um, and I can simulate the total demand uh, by just taking the average of the, uh, of the uh, demands for each of the simulated uh, choice sets. Uh, and that gives us uh, a pretty uh, accurate uh, estimates of the total demand. And then for each demographic subgroup, we can do the same exercise. So we can, we can get at the demand uh, of each uh, demographic subgroup for each uh, uh, neighborhood. So the three moment conditions, uh, we, we first have the set of uh, BLP moments. We back out uh, the uh, base utility. Here there's some substantial point, which is uh, it, regardless of the way we formalized it, is that the BLP approach typically says, well, there is X percent of the people that have chosen this option. That must mean that their utility for this option is, is, you know, it's high. If X is high, it's high utility for this option. What we have here is that we say, well, it's not revealed preferences, but it's, it's also borrowing constraints that are revealed uh, in, this, in these choices. And so we back out the vector of base utilities uh, by accounting for the constraints in the choice set. Um, then I have, uh, and then we perform the IV regression. Then we have a set of micro moments where we just say, well, how does the predicted demand match the observed uh, demand for each subgroup. And then we do this uh, uh, IV uh, regression. We get this uh, three sets of moment conditions uh, that allow us to identify all of the uh, parameters, the structural parameters of the model. And, and that will allow us to uh, simulate the comparative statics and make predictions on the distribution uh, of, of, um, of, um, uh, 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 yeah, of house prices. Um, so for each uh, block group, we have uh, uh, probabilities of, of approval. These are the observed uh, uh, average approval rates. And one of the challenges will be to uh, identify the causal impact that is not used the observed approval rates, but to, to control for the self-selection of households into the application, uh, in the application pool. So uh, the, the, when, when obtaining the uh, pr probabilities of approval, we use the Home Mortgage uh, Disclosure Act data where we regress the probability of approval on the range of uh, household uh, and uh, mortgage and neighborhood characteristics. Uh, and we merge it with the liquidity of the corresponding bank. And the big identification issue is that the application is not random. So for instance, if we use the, uh, in the census, we use the set of movers into a neighborhood, that is households that have been there only for the last year, uh, we, uh, we get a sort of a back of, of the envelope estimate that there is about two to three mortgage applications for each uh, household that, that moves. And so there's a large, very large amount of self-selection into the pool of applicants. And so the way we address this is by using this liquidity of, of the bank. Um, and the, the other problem that we face is that people don't choose their financial institutions at random. So we can't just use the liquidity of the closest uh, bank um, but we'll use the liquidity of the five closest uh, banks uh, to instrument for uh, the probability uh, 
uh, of, of, of approval. So uh, we can just start with a first instrument saying, well, we're going to use the average loan to income ratio of the nearby five bank branches. We, we can just move one step further and exclude branch, bank branches set up after 1985, saying we don't want bank branches that have been set up uh, in response to the perceived demand for, for credit in that particular uh, neighborhood. Uh, so we take all of the uh, old bank branches. And then finally, our preferred instrument is the liquidity uh, level of the bank of the five closest bank branches, excluding the branches that have been set up after 1985. And so that allows us to really look at the flow of liquidity from the national bank to uh, the local uh, neighborhood. So for liquidity, we use the right ratio of uh, securities to total assets uh, being used by uh, Lutsky 9 2011. So each uh, bank branch uh, here, I've zoomed in on, on uh, a particular set of, of block groups. Uh, uh, each bank branch has a corresponding uh, level of, of liquidity that will explain the local uh, uh, supply uh, of, of uh, credit. I should have, uh, I should have said uh, uh, when I was saying banks in Hamda, I should have said mortgage lenders rather than saying banks because indeed the set of mortgage lenders is, is greater than the set of banks. I have to say we're probably using a local average treatment effect where we we're using an instrument that affects part of the market and not the entire uh, uh, the entire market. One of the things that we've done because we see the pool of uh, applicants changing over time uh, in a big way in fact and uh, and one thing we've noticed that is important is to keep uh, the distribution of demographics across time constant because just regressing on 2000-2006 the probability of approval on the on the characteristics I get very different results than if I keep the pool constant and so, so uh, uh, that has a significant impact and it sort of overcomes some of the uh, critiques that have been made, I think, by uh, uh, some of your colleagues at the, at the board, your previous colleagues at the board, on the fact that the approval rate doesn't change that much. But in fact, if you regress and you keep the demographics constant, you actually see that the ap approval rates is increasing and that the coefficients go in the direction of a, 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 a relaxation of lending standards. So, so keeping the pool constant is very important. Now, I'm not going to be able to address with the liquidity thing. I'm not going to be a be, uh, address that, that part of the, of the market that is shifting at that. One more question. How, how do you think about the likelihood that uh, more unstable banks are likely to be more concentrated in poor neighborhoods? So that unobservables about the neighborhood are correlated with the yeah. Right. Yeah. So. I think part of the, the reason why uh, I use a combination of the national bank and the fact that its bank branches set up after 90, uh, 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 before 1985 is that some of the changes in demographics that have happened between 1985 and the beginning of the period of analysis have sort of washed out part of the correlation between what was that bank before 1985 and what was that neighborhood in 1985. Uh, there, there still remains some correlation, but we've sort of removed uh, part of this. The fact that there's been some gentrification uh, in the eastern part of the, of the bay is, has loosened that correlation. Uh, ten minutes left, okay. Estimation results, perfect. Um, so when we regress the, uh, um, uh, the probability of approval on the uh, characteristics of the loan, the characteristics of the household, and we uh, use the IV as the liquidity of the nearby branches, uh, we get uh, impacts of the LTI ratio on the probability of approval that is about a one, an increase in the LTI ratio by one lowers the probability of approval by 13 percentage points. Uh, and there's some uh, changes uh, from the, uh, from the uh, IV, the first IV, and the IV that uses the, the liquidity of the nearby uh, bank branches. Um, these are the uh, IVs that used the uh, bank branches set up before 1985. And this is, in addition, uh, instrumenting uh, the racial composition uh, by the racial composition of the agents and neighborhoods, taking care of, of some additional sources of, of endogeneity. Um, so at the, uh, uh, at the bottom of the slide, I have one of the uh, uh, findings, the key findings of the paper, 
uh, which is that when we regress the base utility on the neighborhood characteristics with and without the borrowing constraints, we can assess whether the borrowing constraints have an impact on the estimated willingness to pay for amenities. Uh, that is, the fact that people are constrained in their choice set, uh, in their choice of neighborhood, means that their willingness to pay for some of the amenities may be much greater than using traditional uh, models that don't take into account the borrowing constraints. And so the willingness to pay for one interquartile range of school test scores uh, goes from uh, uh, $9,000 to $23,000. And so a substantial bump up in uh, these willingness to pay uh, uh, measures. Uh, so the willingness to pay here being the change in uh, house price that compensates a corresponding change in uh, amenities. Uh, uh, I am going to report uh, the willingness to pay for uh, racial demographics uh, for variables in fraction uh, as a one percentage point increase and for the others the standard deviation. This is, uh, these are two graphs that show the conditional elasticity as a function of the initial log price and here the borrowing elasticity as a function of the initial log price. And we see here that the places that have uh, high uh, log prices initially at the beginning of the period have higher uh, conditional elasticities uh, in magnitude and they also have higher borrowing elasticities in magnitude. Uh, for conditional elasticity is very consistent with uh, what we would expect given micro theory. Now if you look at the distribution of these elasticities, we can compute the share of the borrowing elasticities in the total elasticity. And we see that the share of the borrowing elasticity in the total elasticity goes from 42% to 73% with a median share of about 55%. So very big impact of uh, borrowing on the price sensitivity of households um, for in their demand for households, for neighborhoods. Um, so, now I'm going to come to uh, what we think uh, uh, requires a formal uh, modeling of the, of the landing uh, standards, which is doing the comparative statics of the mount, uh, sh uh, uh, accounting uh, for the shift in landing standards in the shift in house prices. So uh, what we're going to do here is that we're going to uh, change the coefficients of the landing standards uh, regression. Uh, and see how the demand expands uh, as a consequence of the relaxation of the landing standards. And in each neighborhood, how, by how much each price needs to increase to compensate for that increase in demand uh, and to keep the city at equilibrium. I start with uh, uh, in perfectly inelastic supply of housing in each neighborhood in the Bay Area. I guess the Bay Area makes this first application uh, reasonable, I'm going to account for places where the increase in demand can be followed by an increase in the supply of housing uh, units. So to do that, to do that simulation of the impact of landing standards, I'm going to realize that the uh, shift in landing standards here, psi, affects the demand in uh, three different ways. There's the direct impact, which is positive. The relaxation of landing standards leads to an increase in the demand. But there's also an impact that is due to price changes. Um, and um, so the increase in the uh, prices in each neighborhood leads to uh, a decline in demand. And then there are some also some uh, social preferences effects that are driven by the fact that the relaxation of landing standards can lead to mass movements of uh, particular ethnicities to particular uh, neighborhoods, uh, uh, causing some tipping behavior uh, of, some, of some neighborhoods. And so because of this, we want to keep the city at equilibrium. We can actually find in each neighborhood the compensating log price increase that corresponds to the uh, relaxation of landing uh, standards by just doing those comparative statics and the implicit function theorem. So to simulate the relaxation of landing standards, I'm actually going to estimate the shift in the coefficients of the landing standards specification uh, using Hamda, weighing for, uh, uh, to keep the pool of applicants uh, constant over time, uh, instrumenting, and then we get shifts in all of the coefficients. The sensitivity to log price, log income, the shift in the constant, there is an increase in the volume, uh, and uh, the shifts in the probabilities of approval for each race and ethnicity. So the first uh, thing we see on the left uh, hand side of this slide is that if we picture at, on the horizontal axis the initial log price in 2000 
And on the vertical axis, we put the predicted log price change. We see that the slope of that relationship is negative. That is, there are greater uh, increases in prices at the bottom of the log price distribution and at the top of the log price distribution, which is this compression of the uh, price uh, distribution. And we get a fairly uh, right skewed uh, distribution of our uh, log price uh, changes. Um, the, we can decompose this compression of the price distribution into the partial uh, equilibrium demand effect. There's the social interaction impacts. And then uh, there is the fact that there are differences in elasticities uh, of uh, uh, demand across neighborhoods that yield that uh, compression of the price distribution. This is comparing the uh, predicted uh, uh, log price changes from the model with the actual log price changes uh, that are observed in the data. And uh, in the data, we also observe this compression of the price distribution, this negative slope of the relationship. We don't fully account for that part of the distribution, but we do a, a reasonable job at predicting the shift in the uh, distribution. Each of those points is one of the 4,500 blog groups in the data. The compression of the price distribution has been observed in Los Angeles, San Francisco, San Jose, Washington, DC. So there are other MSAs where we could apply this. And if we compare the correlation coefficient for the compression, it's minus 0.3 predicted and minus 0.7 log price. We can, and I'm going to conclude with that to keep with the time, we can also, uh, using the log price change that has been uh, uh, backed out from this model, uh, we can see what is the shift in demand for each uh, demographic uh, subgroup. So the idea here is that even if the city stays at equilibrium, uh, there are shifts in uh, the demand of particular ethnic and racial and income groups that mean that the city can stay at equilibrium, there's gonna be out inflows and outflows of those groups in and out of uh, neighborhoods. So we can compute uh, the shift in the demand driven by the shift in lending standards. And we can go back to some of the uh, measures of segregation that have been used by uh, Cutler, uh, Vigdor, and Glazer in their papers, which is, for instance, the exposure of blacks to whites, which is the average fraction of whites uh, for uh, a, in the neighborhood of the average uh, black uh, individual. And we can have a structural interpretation of what's the impact of landing standards on the shift in the uh, exposure measure, the pure shift in exposure driven by shifts in landing standards. And there's one graph which, which uh, um, I really like, which is this, this graph here, and I'm going to conclude with that, uh, which is that in red here, we have what the model predicts in terms of um, uh, inflows of whites into each neighborhood. And on the horizontal axis, I have the fraction of blacks in 2000. So you may recognize from this graph the Card, Mass, and Rothstein 2008 QJ that looks at tipping and the dynamics of segregation, where they do this in a, in a non-structural non way. Here what we see is that the Card, Mass, and Rothstein result is due to the general equilibrium effects because the black points here are the partial equilibrium impacts of the uh, landing standards. And the result that we find is because the whites bid up housing in the uh, minority black areas, that actually leads to inflows of whites, but outflows of uh, whites in the mixed uh, uh, racial uh, uh, neighborhoods uh, in uh, between 2000 and 2006. Uh, so I can predict exposure and uh, isolation. We have robustness checks on housing supply elasticity <coughs> using satellite data. Uh, we show the robustness of the results to demographics, uh, supply elasticity, racial shifts. Uh, and so uh, that's the conclusion. Thank you. You never actually get all the housing transactions occurring at any one time. We get this sort of selection. We have selection problem, we have heterogeneity problems, we have all these other problems. And for me, I thought to understand these different indexes, the right, maybe the best thing to do is to simulate it, create a complicated world that was realistic, that had it had amenities, had location amenities, and have shocks of a variety of sorts. And then I could actually know the true price of the houses, and then I would sort of throw off some sales and then see what I could learn from the, from the indexes. And I spent six months in this project, and it was a waste of time in the end, because the thing is building complicated models to actually simulate the world is really tough.
Okay, so the, the reason I started with this one is because I, I started reading this paper and I was like, I spent six months trying to make this work and these guys are doing the same thing. Okay, so they've actually trying to calibrate an entire world that's really, really complicated and they do a ton of work and I would say they do a ton of really good work to make, I would say, good faith efforts to make proxies that work. It's just really complicated. Okay, so, um, uh, so let's get started I'll real, real briefly about this stuff. It is, it's 103 pages long. So for those of you who just printed it up to, to, to kind of breeze through it, there's a lot there. It's a shockingly efficient paper, so I really did actually go through it pretty quickly. Um, they're really, they don't waste any, like they, all the words are efficiently used. So there's no fluff to fight through. Every statement adds value somehow. There's just an awful lot to do, okay? So the second is really useful. Um, okay, so just, I, the other thing is, I, I was thinking about this as the Sunday, I, when I, when I, before I had kids, I used to do the Sunday Times puzzle, and I, I get up there Sunday morning, and you'd sit there and you think, I've got a whole bunch of clues to fill in, and I've got a whole bunch of boxes to check off, or I've got a lot of work to do here. Go, this, and this paper feels like that. In order to get all the stuff they want done, they've got to they've got to fill a lot of boxes before they can get to the part they want to get to. And so, a lot of the paper they go they start the paper talking about the modeling, and they step through that very efficiently, and then they go through this big bit of big bit of work to get the parameters for this. Then, if they're happy, then they do the work. Then, so there's just there's a lot to do. Okay, so um, these are some of the things they touch here. Um, they got tipping there. I didn't add this tippings on this list. Should be on this list also. But they've got. Mortgage debt, house prices, location choice, housing segregation, urban form, differentiated goods, and, and financial frictions. And these are all things they touch in the paper. These are all broad literatures. Just to be clear here, there's people who spend their entire career working on location choice or housing segregation, right? And so, you know, to get 103 pages in all of this in there is like still you know, an astonishing amount of work to get done in a short amount of time. So they have to take some, they have to take some, you know, shortcuts to get this thing done. Okay, so let's just keep in mind that they're doing an awful lot in a short amount of time. Um, the math they go through, and these are just the headers from their sections, but they, they first start with um, neighborhood choice and conditional uh, on credit availability. And, and for the, from the, let me just to keep things off here, I actually think the story's right, okay? So I think credit availability matters quite a bit. I think the value they add in the paper is doing this, okay? So I think the, I'm starting off from the, the preposition, I, when the, they, they, I read the abstract and I was like, I believe the basic result. And so the question is, how, do you, how rigorous can it be? How much do I, do I believe the numbers in? So they go through this process of, of, um, of, of establishing a conditional choice on, on, uh, on credit availability. Then they endogenize these choice sets. Again, not trivial to do this. Um, define neighborhood demand. Again, a very hard thing to do, I think, very well and cleanly. They define these elasticities, which again, are a little bit squishy here. And then they have established a city equilibrium. So all of that's done with the math in the first part of the paper, and it takes 14 pages. It's just really amazing. Okay, so all these moving parts here. Um, and then we get to the identification and the estimation, there's lots of parameters and there's lots and lots of regressions. So they, I think, did more work than anyone else did here. That's what I'm, that's what I'm guessing. <laughs> that's what I'm guessing. There's just all these different topics, all these different estimations, all these parameters, all these models, they all, you know, a lot of work. Um, so they estimate the lending standards, they estimate the base utility, they establish preferent heterogeneity, and then they do the structural estimation and they do this GMM to get their, the, these data sets, um, numerous data sets on to get sets of estimates. So they need to get sets of estimates. There are all these parameters they pull out to put in their models. Okay, and then they lead in themselves into this general equilibrium part here. Okay, so let's get on to the part. So again, I'm, I think the basic structure, qu basic question about whether or not credit availability matters is I think an obvious one for all of us. Okay, so I think that's, it, it does, it matters quite a bit. And this idea about finding compression and finding segregation is something that's very interesting. And I think what they've done here is the way to view this work is not to say, now we had the quibbling here at I think Nate asked a good question. Stuart asked me some questions over there. They all ask good questions about this stuff, but I think the, the question you should ask yourself is, are they making a contribution to move the modeling forward, to kind of push the lead, push the, push the lever on, on getting credibility to be more part of the conversation? I think they do this. So here's my list of problems. So Humda is a problem for a couple of reasons, which people sort of talked about a little bit. The FNC has sales in it, right? And so we know that sales are selected, right? And so over the course of 2000 and 2006, availability of subprime meant that we had a big rotation and more activity in poorer neighborhoods than upper, uh, in other neighborhoods. So the fixed part of your fixed effect models isn't fixed. There's a big rotation in this model. So I think this is a problematic thing. The API scores, again, is it a proxy for housing quality? I mean, for a neighborhood quality or school quality, I mean? It is, but if you dig deeper into the APA scores, there are lots of, a well, lots, 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 but in my experience in Southern California with API scores that are average, if you're a white middle-class household in an average API district, the API scores for the whites is actually quite high. So if you're looking, you're looking at diversity and segregation and, and location choice based on, on racial and est social estimate variables, is that the API you use for a system as a whole varies a lot 
school by school by school and depends on who you are. So it's again, it's a rough proxy. I think it's approximately right, but I think there's lots of exceptions to it. The CBD, this is my big beef on monocentric models in general, but you know, 92% of the employment in San Jose is not in San Jose or San Francisco. It's actually spread out throughout the region. So using a CBD to capture job access or shopping access doesn't make tons of sense. And seven out of eight trips that they make, household trips make are not for employment. So, you know, I throw that in there to capture something and that's a great monocentric model and it's true, but the, the reality is it's, it's quite different than that. Um, the ACS is a problematic from a sampling perspective. The 1% is a problem because the, the geography of the census one sample is the Pumas, right? That's 100,000 households. And so you have really small block groups and you have these big Pumas that have lots of geography. What they've done is they've assembled this giant list of things here, all of which are imperfectly measured. And that's, that gets to the heart of my sort of issues. Like, once you interact all those things, it's hard to do. And I get back to my model with my, my hypothetical, the city I called was uh, Appleville, my simulative simulation I wanted to do, is I never could, I could, could match the means, and I couldn't actually make it look real, if that makes sense. Qualitatively, the full distributions never looked right when I, when I built my simulated models. And so the thing I, don't wor I worry a little bit about in this one is just that the, number, the amount of, of noise in doing all this stuff, I would say, tend to compounds over time. So at the end, I'm not so sure what I've got. So each one of your steps you make, I think, is a reasonable proxy. You know, this thing about the, the bank being nearby or not is, you know, I've been, I've had, what, seven mortgages, and I've never left my house. And so I don't know, I don't know what the bank, nearest banks have anything to do with me or not. And I just really fished online, and so I, I'm not really sure what to do with that one. The 20% down payment is certainly not true, stable over this time period also, right? So we had this, you know, I think in San Diego, I don't have data for San Francisco, but for San Diego, the percentage of purchase mortgages that went from, uh, exotic mortgages that were negative amortization or interest only went from 6% in 2000 to 59% in 2006. So this is just, this is just, this is not right. And this isn't going to be uniform across the metropolitan area, right? So you've introduced a whole bunch of, by making that assumption while well, reasonable, has introduced some bias into, the, into your numbers. Okay, so other, those are sort of particular data issues. The larger issue is, I'm not so sure, if, you know, you've written this equilibrium model, right? And you've proved equilibrium. I don't know what to think about equilibrium is in 2006. You know, the world's about to fall apart. Fundamentals, are, prices have gone way beyond fundamentals. We have an entire infrastructure for, 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 for delivering mortgages to people who don't need them. I don't know what equilibrium is. So I'm curious, I kept reading the paper about the equilibrium and the existence of the equilibrium, and I'm not so sure what equilibrium is in this case. We have lots of population, you've got a closed system, you've got lots of population changes, and on net they don't change very much, but there's a huge outflow of domestic people in San Francisco and an inflow of foreigners. Foreigners were buying all cash, and they had different races. And so you had, there's all these moving parts that are introducing into your, into your um, calibration model that just isn't, isn't consistent with the assumptions you make. Um, all right, so I'll leave it there. And the other thing I would say is the spatial correlation is that a lot of your regressions are a census tract is the unit of analysis. But the thing that makes these neighborhoods neighborhoods is the contiguity of them. And I think the expectations about a behavior on one census tract is affected by the ones around it. And we don't handle that in your model at all. Okay. So, um, in, in, so let me go back to here to page 46, about halfway through. Um, the paper's goal was to improve our understanding of the equilibrium relationships between lending standards, location choices, house prices, and segregation. And I think the question I think you have to ask yourself, I, I believe that you've done this. And I think the question for us is how, how hard do you want to push the parameters? So I mean, I think that you've demonstrated, I think the, the, the sign is right. And I think it adds up to a significant number. The question is, is it 0.2, is it 0.8, is it 1? I, I, this is the part I've lost, I've lost confidence in. And so, I think the paper's idea is basically right, and you had me at right, the opening paragraph, borrowing constraints explain, I think that's, they, they have to matter. What's gained from quibbling with me about the fact is why, why, why spend so much time on the actual data and not simulate it? And just pick some parameters that you know, and then can let people play with them. Put some ranges on it, put some, put some, some confidence intervals, and then so, and I would say you've got this model set up, you've got the, the toolkit up, so put some parameters that we can actually defend, or at least understand, yeah, thanks, and then, We'll get there. Okay, so what I want to do is um, primary contribution to the model. Yeah, I would say the simulation is the way to go. But just to give you some data on from, from stuff I've, I've been thinking about, is, is this to, 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 to prove you're right, that you're on the right track here. This is a map of, these are census tracts. I've got three cities. I've got, I've got uh, uh, Cleveland, Detroit, and um, Los Angeles. And this is uh, the median census tract in uh, house price in, um, in Cleveland. So this is a house in Cleveland in, in 2000 that had a median house price of 350000 this is the ratio of 2000 to 2006. Okay, so this house track went from 2000 to 2006 and didn't move at all. Okay, places that were at the lower end of the spectrum went up. 
And why is that? Credit availability, right? So this is subprime. Households that didn't have access to credit got access to credit and their house price changed. And so this is the compression you see at the low end of the spectrum. These people went up and these people were constant. You pull that away and that same, same coordinates here, they, this is scientific, but same numbers here, that same 350s right here. So it went up. So as the housing bubble went up and down, this house price didn't change at all. But when credit came and went, it went up and then down. Okay, so you can do this for, for, for Detroit, where you have all of Detroit went basically during the housing bubble years went nowhere, except the, the subprime areas went way up. And then during the down years, this is mostly, on, you know, went down about 20% here, and then the low end of the spectrum got hammered. So Detroit was just flipping around here on, on, on based on, on credit availability. And you can do it for LA too. So here's LA, here, everywhere in LA got more expensive over 2000 and 2006, but it was really access to credit at the bottom that did this. Stop, okay? My point is, I think this is, this is evidence you're onto something that's important. Credit availability clearly matters. And I think the, the challenge I have in reading your paper is I'm not so sure what parameter to believe because you've done so much work and made so many assumptions along the way. I'm not sure how to interpret it. But that's it. It was a good paper. Thanks.